Ernest Topping was born in 1888 in Wigan and grew up not far from here. In round about, I think, 1904 when this place was built, his father Alfred got out of being a coal miner and opened or became the landlord of this pub, the Victoria Hotel in Platte Bridge near Wigan. Ernest, like all young boys, looked out and saw the trains running across this bridge, going between Wigan and Manchester and possibly dreamt of being a train driver. But other things came into his dreams or into his life more likely uh, and one of those was Evelyn Wormsley. Evelyn and Ernest were courting and got married just around the corner on the 24th of May 1913. They stood in this spot in May 1913 before they emigrated to Canada and we didn't really know much more about Evelyn and Ernest. They left for Canada in 1913 and then Ernest appears in France in 1917. But I did a bit more digging and found out a little bit more about why and how Ernest and Evelyn came back. So I mentioned before, we don't know what happened to Ernest and Evelyn after they went to Canada. We know they came back because we know that Ernest is in France in 1917, but we don't know um, why he's in the Manchesters, why isn't he fighting for the Canadians? And this place here has the answer because this was the Atherton Billiard Hall and Ernest in 1916 was the manager of this place. So this was where Ernest would have left uh, Atherton and gone to the war. Uh, and this was where Evelyn was living when her father-in-law or mother-in-law, we don't know which one, showed up with the fateful telegram to tell her of Ernest passing. It's kind of strange because I've always had this impression of Ernest as one of those happy Tommies who went off to war in 1914. But as I've dug more into it and kind of researched a bit more, realising that he was a married man, he didn't want to go, he had to go, and you know, within six weeks of landing in France, he's dead. My dearest little girl, well, if your name still is, I'm just dropping you a line to let you know that I received your letter and paper yesterday, which I was very glad of. I guess you will be wondering what has come of me. I suppose you will be looking for a letter from me, but you've been up the line and we're waiting to go up again. I think we're going up tonight. I don't care how soon it is all over, and I know you do, but we shall have to keep going and put trust in God to see through it all. I'm sorry to see one of your letters that your mother is very ill. I hope she's a lot better by now. I suppose Tilly Baby's dead. You haven't the luck to keep one. Well, love, what sort of weather are you having? We're having bad. Raining and cold with it. Evelyn, you must excuse my writing as I can't settle down to write. We'll write you a long letter when we go down the line, so excuse me this time. From your ever loving husband, Ernest. This was the railway line. In 600 metres, you will arrive at your destination. Four fifteen a.m. on the 2nd of April 1917, Ernest and his pals were here, just outside the village of Cresselles, and they lined up at this exact spot. And their objective was a railway embankment just 300 yards forward. At 5 a.m. an artillery barrage started. It was supposed to land 200 meters in front of Ernest and his pals and the rest of them, but it actually started 50 meters behind them, causing most of the company lined up here to make a quick scarper and exit. But at 5.15 a.m. once the barrage had stopped, the attack went forward to capture the railway embankment. Yeah. 
As the Manchester's made their way up from the start line, they ran forward towards this railway embankment. But as they got forward, machine gun fire came from a hidden cover that they couldn't see. Snipers were picking people off from above the railway embankment. And over there, a machine gun post by a windmill just opened out and started causing havoc. By 6 a.m. they got on top of the embankment but were back down again. It took till 10 a.m. that morning before they actually took their objective. The big thing we've uncovered is that Ernest isn't listed as buried in this cemetery but along with a, a fantastic historian Jeremy Banning and some other work that I've been doing we're almost certain that he is buried here and I'm going to take you to one of five graves that he is buried underneath. One thing I've not mentioned in the video yet is Ernest Toppin's connection to me. He was married to my great grandmother on my father's side. Had Ernest Topping lived, I wouldn't exist. Neither would my father, my grandfather and his brother, my brother and sister, or my children. And there are thousands, millions of Ernest Toppings dotted around France and Belgium, who a hundred years ago made the supreme sacrifice. On many of the war memorials they say their name liveth forevermore. But Ernest's name won't live forevermore. His line stopped, his lineage stopped with him. It got no further than this embankment in northern France. Cut down at 28. I'm going to leave something on the grave I believe to be Ernest's. It's a little wooden cross given to me by a man called Alan in St Nathaniel's Church in Platbridge, where Ernest and Evelyn were married in May 1913. And I think it's poignant that something all the way from Platbridge, a hundred years later, almost to the day, will rest here near Ernest. <laughs>